So I'm uh, with my friend Stephen Wilson, who's a photographer from Northern Ireland, who's just finished a project. And we're going to talk a little bit about that project, uh, talk a little bit about the themes. And I'm very interested in connecting some of what you're doing visually with some of the stuff that I'm interested in. In fact, I wrote a, an essay in the book, so I have a particular interest in this. As, and I want to talk to you about this, as a practice, I have a feeling that this book uh, could be what I would want to call a decentering practice, but we'll get into that in a second. To start with, I just, who are you? Uh, what do you do? <laughs> Hi, thank you very much um, uh, for being here and also for your essay in the book. It's great, very uplifting. Um, I'm Stephen, I'm a photographer, and I've been a photographer now since I was 17, so 35 years, more, 40 years nearly. Um, I have worked as a photographer and photojournalist in London and then came back to Belfast, travelled a little, little bit around the world, um, seen a few places for newspapers and magazines and then came back to Belfast and worked here for a few years and now I teach photography and do my own projects. Yeah. And by, before we get to this even, do you have certain themes in your work of certain kind of things crystallised or do you have a wide variety of interests? Well, I, when I used to work professionally as a, as a photojournalist, you were commissioned to do work, yeah. or you do work and then try to sell it, so I, that depends on what's happening and where, what you think you can sell. But th since I started doing more of my own projects, which are not commercial projects, this was possibly the first one looking at people's identity, especially in Northern Ireland, returning to Northern Ireland after the Good Friday Agreement and setting up a home here. Things were changing, we were changing, and I kind of thought, well, let's look at this and see how I can represent this as opposed to just covering events which happen in the news. Let's see what's behind the scenes and let's get involved with people. So I've worked a lot with community groups and people who are involved in reconciliation, done workshops and used photography as a tool. Photography is a great tool because people talk a lot about, oh yeah, well, let's do a little art project here. What can we do? And lots of people can't draw. So it's quite a high level of entry into drawing or making art. Whereas photography is a very low level of entry because everyone can take a photograph. Mm. So I do workshops with people quite a lot of the time where we map our areas or show things that are important to us or photograph the streets and our houses and then bring groups together and compare and contrast and open up conversations about my identity and your identity and my location and your location. And I find that fascinating. By the way, I heard a, saw a quote just this morning on Instagram, you know, you get these quotes, and it was about painting, but I thought it was very clever, but I actually think it might be even more appropriate for photography, so see what you think. It said, painting is easy when you don't know how to do it, and difficult when you do. And I kind of think that's potentially even more so with photography. It's super easy when you don't know what you're doing. Completely. I can take photos as much as I want, but when you get into being a photographer, that's when yeah. it gets difficult. <laughs> it is, it is. And like all these things, if you um, playing around is a great thing, but whenever you start to take something seriously, then the play sort of leaves it and then it becomes more difficult. So you've always got to kind of re-engage with that. Um, Picasso said that all children can paint. They just slowly forget how to do it as they get older. Yeah, yeah. And our job as artists is to remember how to paint. Ah, yeah, very good. So it's that playful idea in art. Picasso said a lot of things. Some of them some of them, he famously, what did he say? He said, I want to live like a poor man, but with lots of money. I think something <laughs> like that was brilliant. I want to like, live like a vagabond with nothing, yeah. but with a lot of money. <laughs> I, tell, I work at, and I teach, and um, lots of people ask, and students often ask, and they're struggling with what things mean. And I, I think it's a, he's a great statement. Um, art is a lie that tells the truth. Mm. So do, this is not true, but there is truth in it. And that's a conversation which is worth having, but don't take this as fact. It's not the truth. Yeah. Funny thing is, I Hegel kind of took an opposite position about children. Because sometimes we do romanticise yeah. children. They see things and they can experience things and they have this, and then we lose it. Um, but Hegel's view was actually, well, kids can kind of take a lot in, but actually through education and through training and through these skills, what you learn is too abstract and abstract to a certain point that in a, in a visual or in a concept, you can crystallize something incredibly profound. So um, he was more skeptical of the idea that we, you know, return to being children, saying, well, that's great, that ch childlike creativity. Yeah. But actually what comes from 
because it can be a bit of an excuse as to not do the hard damn work. It's, it's, damn. You have to do, you have to go into the hell of this difficult work of philosophy or art in order to uh, crystallize uh, in, in a simple way as some sort of universal concept. It is, and uh, yeah, we do I- idealize that childish joy. Um, but the key thing I think is over time in your practice, whatever that practice is, you learn skills, and those skills are hard by their very nature, or else they wouldn't be a skill. So keeping, as you learn those skills and become better at doing something and more accomplished, but keeping that enthusiasm is very hard because most people become, you know, obsessed with the skill or just making money and forgetting about the, you know, why they're doing something. So that is, there's an, obviously, it's a kind of a, um, a duality there, which is, you can see the appeal of it, yeah, definitely. The, the craft is something which we, we can't forget. There's a lot of craft involved. Yeah, and like a child can say something very profound sounding, but and, and then somebody who's 80 years old can say the same thing, and you go, wow, those, it's very, very profound. But generally the child is just saying things. <laughs> Whereas the 80 year old who is the, you know, the Buddhist monk who's dedicated whenever they say something like, Hold lightly, or whatever. It uh, it comes from this. It's it, it reconnects with that moment, but it, with 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 such a depth and intensity. That's interesting. Yeah, reconnecting, but that's the thing. Yeah, children are always saying things, but often we, we read quotes on Instagram where people say, "Oh, you never guessed my four year old said this today." By the very I nature of the <laughs> fact that you're saying it means it's an exception, and also yes. you've noticed that. Then most of what they say is rubbish. But this one thing yes. actually sounds a little bit like a philosopher. Exactly, and also we were able to read into it what well, maybe the kid yeah. didn't. So again, <laughs> I, 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 my contention with photography, most of photography is editing. Uh, so what, as a parent, you're doing there is you're editing all the things that the child has said, and you edit out the one, and you present that one, and saying this is important. And that's that's kind of exactly what Hegel was getting at. Actually, is that in a way, whenever it's talking about honing down stuff into a kind of a universal it's editing is probably the photographic version of that is that the ability to to see all the sea of stuff and to find something and we'll get to this book in a way because i think it captures some something universal it's something you know so it is it it's, it's all these things but um essentially you are finding like you say finding something and thinking i want to photograph that and then people say why did you photograph that there's a, a, a quotation by a photographer called Jerry Oolsman and said if you look at something long enough it becomes interesting mm. so the reason it's not interesting is because you haven't looked long enough yeah. you know, is the implication there yeah. and I think Grayson Perry is a fantastic artist um, did a lecture where he said what artists essentially do is point at things and say that's art mm-hmm. I know what art is and that's art so now you need to look at it and interpret it as art they may look at, they may point at a painting, they may point at a telephone box, it doesn't really matter, but their expertise and their knowledge now proclaiming this is art. Yes. So it's like um, the artist Banksy, whenever people, he did a mural, somebody took the mural, cut it off the wall, literally removed it and put it into a gallery, tried to sell it, yeah. and he said, that's no longer a Banksy. Yeah. So I have unowned this. Hmm. I said it was art, now you've done this, I'm yeah. saying it's not art anymore. Yeah. So yeah. with that, I think that's what photography is often we're drawing people's attention to something point framing something and saying I think this is interesting yes I mean even if you if you say the same word again and again and again eventually it becomes foreign and it becomes like an object and you know you could do it with the word cow or something you say cow and until you kind of almost detach it from the signifying yeah. chain and it becomes this object so sometimes I think the artist is is doing that there's these familiar images that become strange through being photographed yeah i think the the, the job of an artist is a strange job and it's a, a confusing job and misunderstood in many ways and also um people objectify something and make it something that it's not mm-hmm. but that is definitely one of the jobs of an artist is to spend time looking and then come back and saying ah you know like you go to the Galapagos Islands and, and study penguins or b- butterflies, whatever else, you come back and say, I spent 18 months and I found this, it's interesting. And everybody else just needs to spend five minutes looking at the interesting highlights. Yeah. That's your job, it's, it's a research job. Yeah, yeah. 
And one of your central insights, or, or sorry, central kind of like interests. And by the way, I did give him a coffee. He just drank it quickly. So in case everybody's watching this, like, <laughs> he's drinking a coffee and never gave his guest no, a coffee. No, he did have a very coffee. good coffee as well. I must say, it's <laughs> really yeah, good I do good coffee. Um, yeah, identity, political, religious identities, like how people. Uh, connect and have a social bond that's something that seems to be of interest to you then. it is of interest and I think um, like all situations when you um, leave a, an area and live somewhere else it helps you you have to sort of level up as it were because you know nothing's familiar but then you also start to notice things about other people you know the tea tastes different here and oh people pronounce that word differently here or they drive on the other side of the road these are interesting things but also you notice about yourself and think I wonder why I did that I wonder why hmm I start asking questions about myself and what my identity is and I think identity these are sort of constructs which are essentially conditioning and their conveniences their shorthands or the way we uh, some of them become are from society around us and some of them are because of geography some of them are personal I think looking at that meant, and being Irish identity is a big thing you know yeah. everywhere you go in the world you know being Irish is kind of like the golden ticket isn't it yeah. <laughs> it's, like the, the, Irish, it's yeah. the one identity where no one's going to fall out with you apart from other Irish, Irish people <laughs> <in history. laughs> yeah. well here I want to start talking about this before we talk about it I just want to say and I'll say this at the end as well uh, this book is currently, it's finished, it's been designed, and you've got a Kickstarter that is designed to kind of raise the initial funds uh, to get the print run done. And we'll have details about how you can kind of see that Kickstarter, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. uh, wherever, beneath this video or something like that. <laughs> Just point at the corner of the screen. Yes, <laughs> right there. <laughs> so, yeah. Just covering my face. That's right, exactly, right there. So, yeah, tell us then about, a little bit about this project, what it's called, what you were exploring. So, um, like I say, it's kind of a discovery, I think, when photography is what I do to help. When I don't understand something, I photograph it. I, I take pictures to try to spend time with the problem and enjoy investigating or interrogating the problem. So I've, um, I've done a lot of work, I said, with community groups and learned a lot about people who work on both sides of the, um, the Northern Ireland problem and trying to bring people together. And I've learned a lot from how, working with people, how our similarities and differences. And I decided to... Um, you know, photograph. Photographers need a thing. In creative world, if you're a sculptor, you can sculpt something that comes into your mind or you can paint an emotion. Photographers look at something and you need a thing to photograph. So quite often what we're doing is we're photographing something that we think represents possibly something else or might be interpreted differently. So it's a point that people can have as a discussion. So I did the usual stuff around buildings, stuff around places, stuff around people. Photograph I photograph people, most of my work is photographing people. And I sort of thought it would be nice to look at the Protestant community, but not the actual people, but look at the community that makes people. That's a, a sort of like a step back. It's not looking at the object, it's looking at the shadow that the object casts. Mm -hmm. And we are products of our environment, but also we shape our environment. I think that's kind of interesting and then there becomes a little bit of a detective thing where people look at something and they're kind of working out, oh, who would live in a house like this? Like that, through the keyhole yeah, programme. Through the keyhole, yeah, I remember that programme. Which, which for anybody who doesn't know, they they would show you around a house and it was a, like some celebrity, yeah. usually kind of a small celebrity, and you had to guess, oh, they maybe gave you four options and you had to guess who owned the house. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which is great because that, we all do that kind of thing and when we see somebody's home, we go, oh, I didn't think you would read those kind of books or, yeah. oh, goodness me, they live in a real mess of a house. Or so we're trying to get a little bit behind the surface. So I, I like that idea. And also um, there is a, it's a story I tell people about. I, working in Northern Ireland, I have had the pleasure of working with some really good journalists who come from all over the world, from New York Times, Washington Post, Paris Match, the Sunday Times in London, coming to Northern Ireland to cover the situation. There's always something happening. Let's do both sides of the argument. And my experience is after a week of travelling around with people taking photographs, they would say, so um, I photo we've been to a lot of nationalist communities where... I ask these nationalists, what is it you want? And they say, we want Ireland as a nation and we want the Brits out. 
Okay, that's a kind of an easy answer. Um, I talk to Protestants about what is it you want, and they say we're not Irish. Yeah. And you go, okay, you're not Irish, but what do you want? And they say we're not British. And they say, okay, you're not British and you're not Irish, but what do you want? Yeah. And they say, why are you asking so many questions? Yeah. And the reporter feels a bit intimidated. They get a little bit threatened. And I thought, that's kind of it. It's a people who are defined a little bit by what they're not. So that's fine. We all do that. You know, we, we leave I home. Like that. I mean, I, I mean, I'm very pro that because I'm against identity politics. So we can get more into it. But yeah, but I, I'm interested in a group of people who don't who don't want to be identified positively with something is very interesting to me. But anyway, keep I'm going. I'm sure we'll return to that. <laughs> we'll return to I that. had done some workshops uh, with a, a, a management consultancy group helping leaders, and they had talked about how um, there is a push and a pull, a motivation to do something. You can be away from something, but somebody grows up in poverty and thinks, this is not a life for me. I'm not going to not be like my parents. I'm going to make money. So they become a successful business person. So that's their push away. And then, of course, they become a successful business person and they think, all this money's useless. I'm still very unhappy. I'm on my third wife. I've started three businesses, sold three businesses. It's really boring because they pushed away from something and escaped it, but they didn't know what they were going towards. Mm. So these consultants talked about how you should have a pull towards a goal. So make sure you visualize a goal that you're going to head towards and review your goal and keep heading for something so you can be positive not negative and I thought that's kind of what this culture has produced you've got a, a group of people but well in Northern Ireland um, the Protestant people based around a faith essentially and that faith has made, meant them splitting from the Catholic Church in Geneva then moving through Germany and the Calvinists and moving to Scotland and then moving from Scotland to Ireland and then of course from here they moved to America. They're always good at leaving groups they don't agree with and leaving because this is not perfect and we can do it better so we'll start again and quite often they move. Now that's a great concept and it's also a good way to refine an idea and it's, nobody should be forced to do something they don't want to do but in that there's a problem I felt of not actually knowing what success looks like. Mm. They sort of know what they don't like and I think there's a struggle internally so then people say, why are you unhappy? Well, I'm going to blame them for my unhappiness as opposed to, I haven't achieved a goal. So I thought it'd be nice to photograph that and that kind of kicked that a long story here but that I thought there's something intrinsic about this culture which comes from a faith and the faith is something which is kind of in many ways to find is not something. I know the faith is quite clear and people who have a strong belief will tell you what their faith means but there's a very strong um, push away and a very difficult looking towards and as I unwrap that we'll talk I'm sure more about how that is very visual and it's yeah. very difficult to exist in a void. Yeah because it's funny so I love this right and one of the reasons why I loved this book and it, but we haven't even, it's funny, we're talking very abstractly. <laughs> yes. So what is it? Actually, in fact, before I jump in with theory, then concretely, uh, what's it called and what are the photographs of? Because I don't think we've, we've we said that. that. Yeah. No, we've gone <laughs> yabber on about art and not top of the book. Which is what these people will want, right? If there if are people who follow my work, yeah. they, more, they like the theory, but still <laughs> to okay. contextualise it a tiny bit. Yeah, um, so the book is called Liminal because I was photographing churches and we'll see some of these photographs, I'm sure, Peter will put them up on the screen. And I photographed, <laughs> I thought to understand the people, you have to understand the faith and the faith, I can't photograph a faith, so I'll photograph what these people hold in important. And that's, like I say, these people, it's my culture. I come from a very uh, religious Protestant culture. Um, and the faith is the important thing. So what's happening on TV and what's happening in government and politics, what's happening in the village, Mm, not so important. What's happening in church? Crucial. Okay, and your part in what's happening in church and your role in this operation is extremely important and a lot of your identity comes from that. And I thought, let's look at the buildings that this happens in, maybe a bit more impartially because I haven't been in them for years um, since I moved away. So I thought, looking at them, I'll come back and realised, yes, there's a, a stoicism, there's this idea of lack, there's this idea of we can't have a distraction Catholic Church is very ornate with lots of icons, lots of paintings and drawings which illustrate stories. You can follow them. So people who can't read and 
understand the written word can look at an image and tell a story. Protestant churches don't have that because that would be distracting. So I came up with this word, I, I thought liminal, which is a, build, a, a space which is a transition, so a train station is a liminal building which you move through on a journey, a train station is not a destination. And I thought churches are liminal spaces because you move through them to meet God. So I'm going to photograph this space that's not meant to be looked at, it's here to be passed through, because you don't go to a train station and stand around looking at a train station, you, you rush through it to get on your train to get to meet your friends. Yes. So let's stand back and think, well, if we're going to have to have a building to keep us warm and dry, but the building's not going to distract from its main purpose, what, as a design concept, that's fantastic, but it's not engaged with in that way, it's more engaged with in a, oh, well, it's cheap and it's functional, and it's warm and dry, beyond that, we don't really need anything more. And I thought, let's look at that, because that kind of sums up my experience of a personality type where hard-working people of faith you know, they don't really want you to say, those are nice shoes, mm. or I really like your hat. They want you to say, you're a good person, or why weren't you at church on Sunday, or what did you think of that sermon, or they want to discuss the important things and the peripheral things. So we live in a very <coughs> commercial world, and, and the peripheral things. Um, Richard Avedon was a great photographer, and he talked about, as a photographer, uh, people talk about, oh, I want to scrape below the surface and see the real person. but. The surface is all we have. Yeah. We photograph the surface. We can't see what's inside. There is nothing else. Yeah. So we have to look at the surface and use that as our, our, yeah. our, our toy box. Yeah. Because this is then gets to the heart of my interest with this book. Um, is I am very interested in this idea of space, of desert, of gap, and of no identity. And what you've kind of caught in these images, which as you say, like in Catholic churches, you have so much iconography. It's like you look everywhere and there's images and there's stories. And, and you know, one of the reasons for that is almost to overwhelm the senses, to, to bring you to a sense of considering the transcendent. But these spaces that you have photographed are spaces that are empty. They're quiet. They're desolate. Um, and there's something so here's the thing and I'm interested because I don't know whether you went into this almost kind of like like this is at first this is maybe a not a great thing or something but I think your book is a celebration of a type of negation a type of uh, uh, nothingness and you know, for me in a society of pure positivity where it's all about doing and having and being and, and, and filling your life with all sorts of things and seizing mm -hmm. the day and all of that, um, having a desert in the oasis, having a space which is not about some getting some object, whether it's God or whether it's drugs or a person or whatever, but being in a space of, of li a liminal space mm. and directly enjoying that liminal liminality, if that's a word. Um, is something I think we're profoundly missing. This, by the way, is why I see your book as potentially, which looks like a hymn book. I want to talk about that in a second. It's, it's designed almost like a hymn book, but with this void in the middle. Um, the reason why I like to call it a decentering practice is in the midst of all of the intensity of life, uh, opening this book and seeing these images that are so quiet and so spacious and so liminal uh, that for me is a way for people to take a breath from something like Instagram <laughs> you know so there's something about no identity there's something about spatiality there's something about nothing that I mean you're kind of in one sense photographing nothing <laughs> yeah uh, that, that in one way when I started digging around and chatting to people who understand theology more and people in the church and people who have read more theology and yourself and others I, I kept coming back where people talked about yet yeah, so it's this idea of nothing so nothing can distract from the worship nothing can distract from your commune with God so these icons or gilded walls become a, a distraction and we know it's you know, we all go to cathedrals when we visit a beautiful Italian city we look at a cathedral because it's beautiful and, and you do feel lifted onto a higher plane but you kind of get 
distracted by the object mm. and, and you become to essentially worship the object. So there is an element of that and I thought that is what I really, if nothing can represent us as a community, I want to photograph nothing. Yeah. And that's why I thought, well, maybe people saying, I'm not British, I'm not Irish, why are you asking so many questions? I don't like where this is going. They're essentially saying, you can't put me in a box. Mm -hmm. Don't try and put me in a box, just let me, leave me alone. Yeah. Which is a fair, like, you don't have to have a flag, you don't have to have a viewpoint. I, I can just be me. Yeah. We are human beings. Being is, is good. Yeah. We don't have to do or have a name. And I kind of thought, well, actually, that comes across wrong, but actually, as a concept, that's quite a good concept. And yes, I, I love the way you said it because whenever I'm defending it, it's like the way it, the way it's done here is often not great, but in it there's something good, and that's why I think what you've caught is like yes, on the surface, and that's why Protestantism and loyalism is to a lot of, large extent a laughing stock in terms of for a lot of people, especially the educated people, the elites laugh at loyalists yeah. and, and they're a joke um, but actually I think there's something profoundly beautiful um, and powerful and universal in a loyalist experience and I think that you're capturing that and that's what I want to get to because it's so easy to to reject and see them as a laughing stock but there's something about protest Protestantism protest there's something about I am not the not, the nothing, the negation, that, <clears throat> and it is, and I would say, is, is universal. That we're not unified. So w one of the critiques that people who are liberals who associate with the left, one of the things they say is that those who are liberals on the right, uh, they affirm positive universals like merit, truth, justice, facts. So people on the right tend to go, we want to build a community based on universal principles that that are the same for everybody, right? To say truth, merit, facts, whatever. So facts don't care about your feelings, meritocracy. These are mm -hmm. talking points on the right. And then people who, are, uh, ident who embrace identity politics, they say, well, all of these supposed universals actually benefit some people more than others. So you say, well, you know, meritocracy, we're all in meritocracy, it's blind, but the judicial system does favor some groups over mm -hmm. other groups. And so they embrace not positive universals, they embrace particular positions. So the position is not equality, equality is the right, equity is the liberal left, left. and equity means you give different groups different things depending on what they need because yeah. there is no universal that just works. So all you have are different communities that intersect with each other and have to learn to live with each other. But the critique of critique, um, I think the Marxist critique, whatever it is, is that no, there is a universal. It's not a positive universal. The universal is we all share nothing in common. That at the very core, as creatures of language and creatures of desire, we are all riven with a type of lack that that is even in language so we speak because we can't can't really ever say exactly what we want to say right so we always that's why we want to take more photos write more books because there's a, there's something we're always missing even when we're brilliant communicators in fact often brilliant communicators are people who are obsessed with saying the thing but they just can't so they have to you know new ways and 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 so language and desire and psychoanalysis are intertwined because both both signal a certain lack that is what it is to be human. So whenever I think of kind of the loyalist community and the fundamentalist evangelical Protestant community and all of the, you know, not so good things, um, there's something bubbling in there of, of the not, of, of, a, of a negation. Um, and it's, it's there, but it's hard to see. You, it's almost like it's almost like it's, it, you have to this is why as photographer you almost have to take a snapshot it's like you can't see it it's a, it's a, but it's there and you've taken a snapshot yeah. of that negative of that negative yeah it's, it's a very interesting because we live in a we are you know spiritual beings in a physical body and there's a struggle and I think it's interesting where this identity came from and it manifested obviously as a religious group a, a faith-based group putting faith first but at the same time concepts 
philosophy was evolving and society was evolving and art was evolving and out of these same revolutions in thinking certain things happened and we have now a modernist movement where it didn't happen at the time this argument formed Protestantism because obviously then to make something more beautiful you just ruled it in more glitter essentially <laughs> <laughs> therefore it's more beautiful yeah. and therefore you get these gilded cathedrals which are just the more glitter the better yeah. a way of thinking was well after a little while there's too much so maybe less is more mm. obviously less is more and in the art world we have now people who spend an awful lot of time designing minimalist buildings and objects and kinds of art where they're trying to work out how little can I show and still get an involvement how how can this object be functional and nothing more than pure function that's a, a design ethos yeah. which we have now developed which has come from the same place yes but interestingly often when something happens we become attached to the way it happened at that time mm -hmm. and then as society moves on the affiliation becomes with the way things happened not with the idea that made it happen so as we, you know people will say oh, i just like it that way because that's the way we always did it yeah. yeah but you did it to be different and to be better and this is not different and better anymore yeah. but we still like stained glass windows because yeah. that's what we grew up with yeah because it's there's an interesting thing in pro the very heart of protestantism uh you know luther uh, he based the theology on the death of God, on the crucifixion. Like he saw the death of Christ as a central thing. And one of the reasons is, is really fascinating is Luther was very profoundly aware, kind of like before Freud and analysis were there, of projection. Very, very painfully aware of how we create the world in our image. We see it not as a nice name says, we see the world not as it is, but as we are. That it is our unknown face, Jung says that, you know, we kind of somehow, um, the way we perceive the world is not objective. Even what we look at, what takes our interest is saying something about ourselves. And this is a, you know, profound insight that has a lot of interesting things to say, right? But I think Luther, he deeply understood that. And so a real challenge for him and was, well, what would it mean to, what, what does religion mean then? Because religion, all religion is, is a projection of ourselves. So it's similar to Feuerbach, is that for Luther, any religion will just be, basically tell us about our own ideals, our own values, our own wants, our own th thoughts on aesthetics and morality and all of that. So Luther was like, I want to build a theology on the death of God because we wouldn't have come up with that. The idea of the eternal, everlasting God dying, right, mm -hmm. is, is such an offense to reason, even logic, because the definition of God is a necessarily existing being, a being that exists of necessity and cannot not exist, right? So that's the definition of God. So to say God does not exist is like saying four sided triangle, and we're not going to come up with a four sided triangle. So in, in this really interesting way, Luther wanted to find something of pure negation, of pure what our minds could not conceptualize, what we couldn't project. And rather, religion is not a projection, but a projectile, something that smashes something open. Um, and, you know, after that, Hegel came along and he did develop a really interesting philosophy from that. But anyway, coming back then to the very essence of Protestantism, I think, is when you strip it all away, uh, liberalism creates, basic, from the perspective of Feuerbach, whatever, is religion is a projection of ourselves. It shows us who we are, shows us what we believe. All religion does that. So how do you avoid it? you somehow have to develop a religion of pure negativity, a pure, a pure no, a pure nothing. And that has influenced both Protestant theology and then philosophy and in, into whatever. But again, I think your work, that's why I think it's true, is it's actually capturing one of the good things of Protestant theology, which is, is, is a, a pure negation. Yeah, and I agree, and I can see that, we, but you might have, push against me on this because I know we probably have different views. So push against if you want. We you have, can be wrong if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, 
conceptually, that's fantastic. And I love your, your uh, pointing out because I heard the word and I thought that's exactly it. Um, we look at a tree and I say to you, oh, look, from this direction, that tree looks like a head mm-hmm. and a person's chin. Mm-hmm. You know, we are, we are anthropocentric. Yes. We see the world, we project ourselves into everything. So it's just a tree with some leaves, but you and I both know it looks like a person. Mm-hmm. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. That's not true. It doesn't look like a person. <laughs> yes. yes. But it does look like a person. So yeah. we enjoy that. And in that, the, the concept the concept is engaging and I think the concept is has holds a lot of water and I find it interesting that Luther was doing that because mm-hmm. that's where this all came from and most people who are engaged with this wouldn't engage with that concept. Mm-hmm. But in engaging with the concept we use uh, emotional language, we use our senses, our smell, our touch our, and we inhabit a physical body which is sensual. Mm. And those senses bring with them good and bad, but that is life. Yeah. So we can't have a concept in an abstract way. It has to. This concept resides in a person who has a personality and an ego and a history, mm. and will engage in that concept in a way that they want to engage, which may be different to the way that you want to. And in that, I think that's the rub of life you know we 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 can't eat a concept yes and i thought actually these buildings are coming from that idea at the time and they're historical almost but they're not following through you know that whenever you talk to somebody um, and you're going to get your kitchen redesigned and you're thinking it's a bit small here and we've got this much money and we don't knock a wall through here and you bring in an architect and they go, yeah, what we're going to do is we're going to tear all this down, we're going to rebuild that, and you're going, jeepers, I want it a little bit bigger here. I didn't want you to take all that, because they're going really into the idea, and they're going to pursue the idea, it doesn't matter the cost, financially or to you, uh, to go through the process. And you're, you're thinking, could you not just move that out, and in two weeks' time it'll be nicer? Because mm-hmm. you're kind of taking small steps. This is like small steps in some way, and... They, ha- they haven't reinvented everything or people aren't courageous enough to redesign the whole world that we inhabit. Yeah. So we'll do a few things here, but we'll still have, we'll just buy a carpet from the local shop and we'll just get the windows that everybody gets and we'll just, you know, everything's that's fine. Yeah. But actually it's not fine because the actual carpet and the actual window are distracting and they're not very pure and they're not very well made. So the Shakers and the Quakers took it a, a stage further and of course they shut everybody else out and they said we're going to design a better broom because the broom we have is rubbish and they spent a lot of time and invented the flat broom or the clothes peg because more less time spent working more time to pray so mm-hmm. hearts to God hands to work their concept was carried as, that's why we studied Shakers in design school oh, yeah. because they decided let's do this as well as we physically can mm-hmm. and let's make this refined and push it further as in they created their their design or their ideal was very min- high minimalist spaces is that yeah. what you're talking about so they would take a, yeah their, their spaces were designed in a very functional way functionality functionality was the main thing function over form but they also would say well if we can spend a few days redesigning a broom and it works 20% better than the old broom, that's 20% more time to pray. Yeah. Therefore, our time has been well spent, let's do that. Yeah. And that's the ethos of design. It wasn't commercial, but it, for them, the, the currency was time spent praying or being efficient with what they had and reusing and making a chair that would last 50 years instead of 20 years. Okay. So their chairs were very highly made, very simply made and structurally very strong, so they would last longer. Yes. So we wouldn't have to remake a chair and re- and waste God's provision to us. Yeah. And that was taking it, of course, it came much later. And it's, of course, in America, where people, where all these people went after they went as far as they could in Europe, they got yes. to Ireland, the next place to go to is America. And those communities did great things there. I think, um, here we have a little snapshot of a concept that's still being worked out, a concept of, yeah, these things is dis- are distracting. Let, how could we be more um, efficient in our journey through? But it's done, and it's, it's obviously not 
it's not half-hearted, but it's done in a way which is not fully formed yet. That idea is still working out. And I think in that, like you said, concepts are our goals and in our struggle to get to the concept, that's where life happens. Yes, yeah. And totally and like just that example I didn't know that about design. It makes total sense. And I mean there's so many things that came out of religion, even like the sciences, but yeah. just the idea that well God would create uh, a universe that you know was rule based and so the early scientists who were religious then kind of like gave themselves to this. So you kind of and obviously um you know Max Weber and the idea of like industrious uh, Protestants, you know, the generation of like capitalism, and so all these things that come out of religion and um, uh, and the age of enlightenment, yeah, because of education in Scotland, yeah, and education was something that was done by essentially, I'm not sure it was just the Presbyterians, but the evangelical Protestants in Scotland invested in education for everyone yeah. to make it a universality, and because of the education system, essentially the enlightenment happened in Scotland. That came out of it, and again, there's a schism, there's a falling apart here. Where and yeah, and there's there's the idea that that the excremental remainder is the thing that then becomes important. So there's a name for it in design. You'll you'll know it if I can remember. But um, there's so many things. For example, uh, you know, cheese. Well, you know, stuff went off, and then it became blue cheese. And then you know, uh, some wine. You know, gets you know, uh, uh, goes off and it's champagne. And there's like, there's lots of things, so many things in our world that are, that were externalities, that were the, the excremental remainder that then become the really interesting thing. What you're photographing is, of course, consciously the excremental remainder of these fundamentalist gospel halls, right? They're not, but, but actually this excremental remainder that you've captured is I think the gold, the gold, this is the, this is the blue cheese, the cheese that went off that you can now sell for double, organic food, those are apples that look a bit shit, we can, you know, put 20p more on so then the sell them as organic, right? This is, uh, you know, the people who are creating these spaces aren't necessarily saying that we need a space of negativity, a space of negation, a space where we're freed from the pursuits of life, free from the pursuit of what we desire, free from some self-help goal, right? Now and they're just creating this space, but you kind of go like, oh, that space that you're creating that really doesn't do anything is potentially a photographing of the most interesting bit, grace, the grace of like you just be, be in this silence, in this space, and you don't want to live in these. You wouldn't want to live in them. But maybe we need to go here for an hour a week. Yeah. Uh, not to hear the gospel, um, but to sit in a space outside of this frenetic pursuit of happiness, wholeness, completeness, positivity. Like uh, there's the, this image of the chair, just like, you know, sitting there alone. Just It just, it just strikes me as a space of being outside of the uh, the world of and, it, and all its frenetic demands to enjoy. In analysis, they go like the super ego now isn't the voice that tells you be nicer to your mum, uh, maybe call a friend who's sick. The super ego injunction for most of us is you're not having enough sex, you're not having enough fun. Oh, there's loads of things happening out there, and you're so it's a it's a super egoic injunction to enjoy life more that causes anxiety mm -hmm. and causes what they call fear of missing out, but it causes anxiety and depression. This is the kind of space for you learn to enjoy missing out. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting because we you mentioned earlier about that Instagram or TikTok aesthetic where more is always better and more choice. You know, yes, it's hard to argue against more choice. It's hard to say you know less is more but this is a kind of an antidote and I think it's interesting because always you know um, to take photography because it's the language that I know I, I grew up in a dark room developing film and shooting film and that was the world I lived in digital came along everyone moved over and said isn't this great 20 years later everyone's going film's quite good I think I'd like to try film something about it and people like me go oh we ripped out our dark rooms years ago all that stuff's in a skip because nobody wanted it and now you can't find a dark room you can't buy dark room chemicals you can't buy enlargers because they're so rare so just at the point where something becomes um, irrelevant and forgotten about another generation come along and go well there's some good stuff in that why, why are we not doing that because yeah. it's not perfect but I can see now that 
somebody's invented it, let's not uninvent it. And I think sometimes I look, I look at these pictures and this work and go, in a world where uh, we've moved on a little bit more and things are very instant and everyone's starting to realise too much information is no information. Maybe we need to step it also, back. It also causes, I mean, modern symptoms of burnout, fatigue, you know, depression, melancholy, even things like ADHD and autism, which are very much on the rise. There's some senses in which uh, there are very interesting uh, thinkers who connect those with a world of uh, saturated uh, uh, material, saturated information. And so this experience, this is why I call this a decentering practice, is that, and one of the things I love most about this is actually the cover of the book, which um, in the essay that uh, I put in the book, I talk about a very small sect. They're so hard to find any information on me talking yes. about this. Is, um, uh, but I don't know even where I heard of them, but a very small religious sect in Russia who, their icon was literally a hole in the wall. They would carve a hole in the wall and pray to the void, the gap itself. And um, this idea that, you know, like one of my critiques of, of atheism, as you may know, or may know, is that, that theism says there is God, a substantive God, and the atheism says, there is no God. Um, but the more interesting position is God is the name for that which does not exist. That you need a signifier of lack. So the, the, by not signifying lack, uh, and you think of it like a zero, a zero is a signifying of nothing, that was a number that was invented, but to, to signify nothingness itself, to make nothingness positive, to, it's like if, we're, if nothingness is part of what it is to be a subject, but we deny that and we avoid it and we try to fill that lack and we try to then potentially that is destructive but if we can make space for that nothingness we can signify it we can uh, uh, like like that pray to that gap in the wall that void in the wall i think that has a salvatory dimension i'm, I'm going to say one thing sorry this might bore you or not but i've been very interested in girdles and completeness theorems so in mathematics it's fascinating um a uh, girdle shows that something can be true in mathematics but not provable and to use a metaphor that I think um, a guy called Rudy uh, mathematician it's his metaphor not mine but to understand girdle he says imagine you have a computer that can compute anything everything that's computable it like so if you imagine the universe is, is uh, a total system of cause and effect, material atoms bouncing against atoms, and you know, ev if you technically knew everything about where everything was and the speed of everything, the position of everything, you could know everything in the past and know everything in the future, right? If you had an infinite mind, you could know everything. Uh, so we imagine a universal truth machine, a computer that you can put in any statement and it will prove it, whether mm -hmm. it's true or not. Uh, Girdle showed that there's something that you that that machine cannot compute, and uh, the metaphor is if I uh, have an algebraic symbol a and I go a equals the universal truth machine will never say that this is true will never prove that this is true right that's the statement the universal truth machine can never prove that this is true. So you put that A is true. So you put it into the universal truth machine. Well, the universal truth machine can't say it's true because then it would prove it's true and then it would disprove it because the statement is the universal truth machine can never prove that A is true. So the universal truth machine can't compute this, but it's true. It's a reality right. that is not computable. So in physics, and Roger Penrose is great, and as he says, this is true in mathematics and in the physical universe. The physical universe generate is completely computable and also generates something that's not computable and he calls that proto-consciousness i think it should be called yeah. proto-unconsciousness right but proto-unconsciousness is a name for saying that that it's not just there's something and there's nothing there's also a nothing that is something that's another dimension of reality there is something there is nothing and then there is a non-computable a negation that is something for me religion at its best has always been an orientation or a sensitivity to that dimension um, that I think is vital for human beings to have a sensitivity to that space of negation. 
And on the front cover of the book uh, is a hole cut and just this negative space. So for me, this is a, this kind of symbolizes Girdle's incompleteness theorem in a sense is, is a, a nothing that is something and that we all need a space to contemplate and to be uh, relate to tarry with that that insistent negativity. That's interesting, and I, I love the fact that you're putting some philosophical framework on this oh, yeah. because I coming coming to it with a visual understanding and an idea of engaging with the emotion that these photographs are engaging with. Mm -hmm. And then I go to a designer and I say, look, I've got this stuff. I want it to look a little bit like this. Can we design a book? And they go, well, I've got other limitations to do with print and color and manufacturing and paper and, and material. So they bring their expertise in and they try to grab my concept or the same idea. And it's all coming at something from different angles. Yes. But essentially, we're quite often co converging on a point. That's why we're, we're here in that. An example, I thought it would be nice to make, can we show the cover oh, book? Yeah. The book with a cover, because there's a photograph, this is a dummy I've made, so it's a very badly made version. There's a photograph of a, like a wall of hymn books, and the old hymn books have got, got a linen cover and a red paper edging, and there's about 60 of them in the photograph. And then behind them, you can see some older hymn books piled up, which are more faded, and obviously they were the ones they used before, 20 years ago, but they're still there. And then you think, there's going to be another wall of hymn books in front of that place. It's like the physical thing of after we don't throw them out. We keep them just in case we have a massive event, which is never going to happen. Yes. <laughs> so the technology, yeah, yeah. the te technology is redundant, but also reminiscent, and you don't want to throw it out. But it's still useful, but it's never going to be used. So anyway, hymn books, very tactile, very well designed, because they hold in the hand and they feel good and they last forever. So I thought that would be something good. Then I got the designer, and they came back with a concept and said, OK, your book's called Liminal about passing through and nothing, wouldn't it be great if we had a slip case where you could bring it out and it would <laughs> unveil the colour and then you've got nothing. And on the cover of the book, oh here, we'll do that, available in all good bookshops. <laughs> um, the book has got a reset, de-embossed space where it looks like it's a photo book, so there should be, I'll grab a picture here, there should be a picture on the cover and that would be a normal photo book. Mm -hmm. where they give you a picture and say this is what's inside but he said why don't we design it to make it look like there should be something there but it might have fallen off or maybe it was never there and that will lead you into the concept of moving through in liminal you know that's like that's a designer just being lazy but the extra mental remainder of his laziness created something really good i know the designer steve <laughs> plus he's just being lazy and it worked <laughs> so i said this is great and i'm going to do a slip case and yeah. straight away he said well why don't you have the slip case with a hole in it to show the hole. Yeah. And I went, oh yeah. So technicalities of things, the book's gonna cost a fortune to make because photo books are really expensive, hence the Kickstarter to raise a bit of funds. It's a high quality book being printed by one of the world's best photo book printers who are in Istanbul, would you believe? Yeah, uh, yeah. Fantastic guys. And they have said, oh yeah, this slip case, first of all, you can't make it, it's impossible. And I went, okay. And he explained why there's a few technical issues to do with the way you make these. And he said, if you make it the way you did, it'll always look rubbish like yours is rubbish yeah. but we won't make them like that so it's impossible okay. so we've got a discussion about it and then secondly the, the case is going to cost double the book yeah. wow. and you think so it's easy to do something which is kind of conventional but something which is a little bit more simple but finishes off the idea well it's have you three, found a way of doing it three times as hard well if you've got money, there's a way of doing anything. <laughs> Literally. When he says it's impossible, you mean, yeah. I don't want to do it, you're going to need to pay yes. me a lot. Like, we can't get people on the moon, so we can't. It is this possible to do it. can be done. <laughs> but that's, I think, an, an illustration, it's a little bit geeky, but to do something quite well, you know, takes you a hundred hours, or, or a thousand hours in this case. To do it very well doesn't take a thousand and ten hours. It takes 10,000 hours. Mm. To do that last 5%, will take 10 times everything you've done up to this point. And that's like the book, I think Slipcase is nice. Mm -hmm. Will people pay three times as much for a book with a slipcase or four times as much? I don't know, but yeah. for me, that's the, yeah. 
Yes. And it might be possible to you what you do want to have the slip case. Oh yes, we're making oh, a, yeah, a, a li- good, no, we're good. making a limited edition, and he'll make a few of them, and that'll be that'll be great. But we won't make as many as the book. But it's just that illustration, I think, why a lot of uh, like the buildings, a functional building with a, a limited budget and a limited amount of time from a limited amount of people, we can do this. Yeah. And you and I come along, and go, oh, this is great. This is it. But it's a little bit rubbish the way you did that, and people would be looking at us, going, are you joking? We can hardly afford this building. Why would we? make it 10 times harder to design a simple chair let's just buy a chair around the corner and stick it in it's okay yeah. so these are everything's a compromise yes. Yes. so these are not design concepts which existed in a university somewhere where they thought how could we be have a liminal space yeah these are people going we've got this working much time with, yeah working with uh, constraints absolutely and yeah. with the concepts that we have with the understanding we have what's the best way to do it and i thought that's actually interesting because yeah. there are pictures here I took a picture of some pews and, and I thought this is a farming community and the pews and stalls look like somewhere you would store animals yeah. because they've worked out the best way to fit the maximum number of people is where this row sits here and looks directly at that person's ear because he's pointing that way but we'll get 20 more people in that's yeah. the point and yeah. it, it will fit because they're all part of our community they're all welcome yeah. and I thought so sometimes the form and the function function and the form they follow yeah well i definitely want to recommend you check out this book check out the the kickstarter if you've got the funds recommend you get this book and genuinely partly one is if you're interested in photography or interested in art but two also as a type of practice i mean you know of taking time and looking at these spaces and looking at these pieces as a way of trying to potentially you know, I think it's a kind of living critique of the society of pure positivity uh, and, you know, needing a space where you kind of get, say, desert in the oasis of life, a space where you can step out of that. I think this book is very, very helpful for that as well. So check out the Kickstarter. Uh, definitely recommend you buying it. I'll be buying a copy. I want to get actually some copies for some events that I'm doing. So anything you want to finish off with before we... Well, no, thank you very much for the opportunity. And just as you're saying that, I think I was involved in a long arc, this project where I went and looked at something, kind of something from my youth, the churches I used to go to and thought, oh, why do they do this? Why is it like that? I was asking questions, but basically not... um, in an in almost combative way in, a, in a taking something apart and after this conversation or after spending time you leave with an appreciation of the, f- the physical form and a more an appreciation of the people engaged mm-hmm. so yeah um, I, I came asking questions maybe with a preconceived ideas my ideas definitely changed and I think hopefully in the work you can see that it's not a, a criticism, it's definitely not a criticism, it's definitely an observation and in that observation I think there's lots to be learned. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Cheers.